Okay, guys, I'm here today with John Danner, huge honor for me, Nikki. Yeah. Guys, uh, John just finished sh uh, shooting his, the fourth part of the New Wave Jiu-Jitsu series, which is the volume two of the guard, right. right, John? Yeah. And can you explain a little more? Yeah. Of um, in New Wave Jiu-Jitsu, we're trying to present the no-gi game, which I teach to my students and which you see them use so much in top-level competition. Our intention in this video is to give you the same kind of training techniques and tactics that they uh, use every day in training and which they use in top level competition. Um, in this particular video, we're looking at aspects of guard work. Now in the previous volume one guard, we focus on what I believe are the two skills you need to develop for the, uh, uh, to, to, as it were, embody the squad philosophy of guard play. The first is the idea of guard retention. You can't play a positive attacking game in Jiu-Jitsu if you don't believe in your ability to retain your guard. Okay? If you believe that every time you try to attack, the guy's gonna pass, you're not gonna attack. You, you won't have the confidence. So the first skill we looked at in the previous volume was a strong method of uh, retaining guard and counter-attacking out of guard retention. We also looked at the idea of strong direct attacks to the legs. I'm sure many of you are aware that the centerpiece of our no-gi guard philosophy is to have strong attacks on the legs. The reasoning is very simple. The legs are the one part of the body your opponent can't hide with posture. They can use all kinds of postural tactics to make it very difficult to enter into upper body submissions, certain kinds of sweeps, but leg attacks you can't hide with posture. As a result, they're the most readily available target in the human body, and so they're the one we emphasize very, very strongly. What you find, Bernardo, is once you develop a strong set of leg attacks on your opponent, your opponents start going into very predictable defensive reactions. And that's where volume two of our guard game kicks in. When we look at those predictable reactions, you feed off them and go into other forms of attack. We're gonna be looking at five key guard play skills, which I heavily emphasize in our training program and which enable us to attack an opponent regardless of whether he's on two knees, on one knee, or standing over us. These five attacks often work well when uh, we have an opponent who's already intimidated by strong leg attacks and they're starting to play a game reacting to that threat. Um, the first of these is based around the notion of distance. Posture can't stop someone from attacking the legs, but distance can. If we demonstrate with uh, yep. nickel keys, okay. If someone stands over us, if they come onto me and come in close, the closer they come, the easier it becomes for us to start entering into various forms of leg entanglement, okay? So what you find with many of your opponents is they start playing a game where they stay at a distance with the legs back that you can't really engage at the legs. Whenever you feel distance and energy is going back and away, that's the time for us to go into the idea of wrestling-based reversals, which involve coming up from seated situations and performing takedowns that uh, look like they're derived from wrestling, but done from a seated guard situation, okay? So if I'm starting to pull people in and I'm getting pullback reactions where people don't want to be pulled into the threat of a leg lock, now it's time to switch from inside foot position to outside foot position and come up into our training partner's legs. Once you make a good bite on our training partner's legs, now you're in the perfect position to come up on training partners and start making good contact and put people down to the mat. We're constantly looking to come up from bottom position and scrimmage up from bottom position into our training partner's legs with combinations of single legs, double legs, ankle picks, arm drags, etc. These are moves commonly seen in the sport of wrestling, but applied in a very different fashion when we're working from guard position. The idea is that when we're working in standing situations, you have to get through your opponent's head and hands to get to the legs. The good news is when you work from guard positions, typically you can make your opponent's hands and head go away from you by pulling down. When I start a pull, my opponent feels the threat of me entering the legs, and so they start pulling up and away. And as their posture breaks up and away, it becomes very easy for us to come up into a pull up his legs and start getting the takedowns we're looking for. So, whenever we feel an opponent is advancing towards us, that's the perfect time for us to go into the first default strategy, which is the legs. When we feel our opponent is doing a good job 
of pulling away from us and we can't get the distance we need, uh, the proximity we need to enter into the legs, that's the perfect time for us to come up into our training partner's legs and start to get people down with wrestling based reversals. This can be done in numerous different ways. We've been looking at double legs, single legs, uh, are also a possibility to come up into single leg situations, coming up off the floor. And of course, you can come up into various forms of picks and come through and just pick our training partner's heels and work the takedowns from here. Um, once you get a reputation as someone who can come up off the floor and scrimmage up from seated positions and form these kinds of takedowns, then you get a different kind of reaction. People start coming in towards you and crowding you. When they crowd us, we go back to entanglements. But let's look now at a situation where our opponent has a good ability to resist the fundamental leg lock attacks that we work with. So if I have an opponent who's coming towards me, we go into our second critical skill that we work with. This is the idea of forming entanglements on my training partner, but not with the intention of leg locking. From here, as we see our opponent going into standard forms of defense, we all go into different forms of entanglement and create distance on our training partner, which enables us to go into a two-phase strategy, where we, could, we put either an opponent's hands on the floor, or we knock their hips to the mat. And, so, and from these situations, we start building up from bottom position and going into the various forms of reversals that we favor. Okay, so once again, the first critical skill that we'll be looking at in this video is skills based on the idea of distance. If I see my opponent is increasing the distance between us in response to a strong leg threat, we're looking to come up from bottom position, scrimmage up from the bottom position, and attack with wrestling reversals. If on the other hand, my opponent is crowding me, then typically what we'll do is we'll start with some form of leg entanglement, doesn't matter which one, anything that knocks an opponent to a hip, okay? Sometimes it may not even be an entanglement, what it will be is anything that knocks into a hip or a hand. Typically what we find is standard forms of entanglement will put hands on the floor. Alternatively, if we're working from here and we're able to knock someone back and send their hips to the mat, we'll get a different kind of reaction. What we're trying to consider here is the idea that if we can put their hands or their hips on the floor, we can make use of a two-part reversal strategy where we use jujitsu based sweeps to knock them to either a hand or a hip and then finish with a wrestling type takedown. Let me demonstrate. If I have an opponent who's overreacting to a pull and I knock them down with a push, from situations like so, I can come up, when we both try to get up together, I will be in, in situations where we can start locking up our training partner's hips. And from here, it's gonna be awfully, awfully difficult for an opponent to stop us getting over his legs and into good position. Okay, so the second great skill that we'll be looking at in this video is kind of a two-phase strategy to reversals from bottom position. The first phase uses fairly well-known jiu-jitsu sweeps, not with the intention of fully sweeping an opponent, but only of knocking him to a hand or a hip. That creates an unfair advantage where if we begin a wrestling scrimmage from that position, you should be able to win against someone roughly your level. Let's have a look at this. Um, picture a simple thought experiment. If I was in front of an opponent and wrestling starts in a neutral standing position, and my opponent had a better level of standing wrestling than I did, it would be very difficult for me to take them down from a position like so. I would have to go through their hands, their head, the stance, their motion, etc., etc. It would be a difficult assignment, okay, if not impossible. Now imagine a different scenario where I start in this position here, okay? If I start in this position, if my opponent was really much better than me at wrestling, he might still win even from here, okay? But I'll tell you what, I'd have a much better chance starting from here than I would have in the neutral position, okay? Now contrast that with a third scenario, where we start in this position here, okay? Even against a very good wrestler, I would be very likely to be able to complete a takedown from this position. There's just too much advantage from here, okay? Even a very good wrestler would be hard pressed to stop uh, any form of decent jiu-jitsu player from, from finishing the takedown from this position. It's just, it's just too much advantage, okay? So 
even though you may not be capable of taking a good wrestler down from a neutral standing position, and you might even struggle if you had a if you were in on a takedown. If you started with him with his hands on the floor or his hips on the floor, you'd have a pretty damn good chance of finishing even against someone who you would normally never be able to take down. So what we use is this two-phase strategy where we use well-known jiu-jitsu sweeps and put them on a hip. And then when we scrimmage from positions like so, it's such a disadvantage for him to start with one leg under my control. When he goes to get up in situations like this, he's legs shelved up and it's gonna be very, very hard for him to stop. Your, your uh, ability to get to his back or get to a takedown under these circumstances, okay? So that's the second great skill we work. This idea of a two-phase strategy where we use classic jiu-jitsu sweeps to knock them to a hip or a hand and then finish with a wrestling takedown. It's kind of like a, a merging of the skills of, of wrestling and jiu-jitsu together. It's kind of an interesting subject. Now, those skills we typically use on standing opponents. But of course, many people, when they're faced with the threat of a leg lock, will drop to two knees. That's not a bad strategy on their part. It shortens their legs. It means that I have to lift underneath them and elevate them before I can get into leg locks. So it's, it's a rational strategy to use. Whenever someone goes down to two knees, the big skill, I'm sure you've all guessed this, which I push on my students, is the use of sumigation, or the hook sweep, the butterfly sweep, to knock people over. And we go through many variations, starting from situations where we just work with collars, triceps, etc., and we're consistently looking to turn people through and rotate them over. We look at the mechanics of good sweeping. We look at variations that my team is well known for, where we work from underhooks, shoulder crunches, going across into pinch head locks, etc., etc. And from a wide variety of grips, if someone stays on two knees, their base of support is relatively narrow. Okay. If my opponent decides from standing position that the threat of leg locks is very, very uh, deep and he's, as a result, pops down to his knees, this is the perfect time for us to work with variations in sumigation. And my ability to get through and, uh, and work with grips, knock my opponent up and put them down, is a big, big part of what we teach in this video. We work a lot with two basic approaches to sumigation. There are what we call grip and sweep methods, where we just literally just get to a grip and throw almost instantaneously. Then there are other methods which involve much more close body contact, the use of overhooks, underhooks, and working our way to a much slower, but more difficult to resist form of sweep. So that's the third great skill set that we look at. This is in situations where someone has dropped down to two knees and is working like so. We also go into, um, a skill set which I believe, uh, Bernardo, you, yes. this is something I've always wanted to talk to you about. There's a skill set in the sport of Jiu Jitsu which I've always believed is tremendously undervalued. This is the skill set of heisting up from a seated position onto our knees. Okay, If you look at most Jiu Jitsu players, when they go to engage from guard position, it's like they have a gentleman's agreement that there's going to be a top guy and a bottom That's guy. That's true. Okay? That's true. And no one wants to be the first one to break the agreement. Yep. So you go out, you pull guard, you identify yourself as, I'm the bottom guy. Yep. And when you work as a, the bottom guy, you, you tend to take on a mindset where the only moves you're going to engage in will be sweeps and submissions. Yep. The top guy is now presented with only one problem, and that's the problem of passing your guard. Passing your guard. Then you watch an MMA fight where when someone gets taken down, what's their first reaction? Most Sit of them, up. they try to stand yep. up, okay? There are three categories of skill from guard position. Sweeps, submissions, and standing up from bottom. Historically, the sport of Jiu-Jitsu has always overemphasized sweeps and submissions and underemphasized the skill of heisting up from bottom position. That makes That's sense. because most of the time when people pull guards, they, they think it's tactically the smart thing for them to do. Then when that is taken away in the sport of MMA, you see a lot of Jiu-Jitsu players struggle to pass guard because now they've got two problems to deal with. You simultaneously have to pass his guard and hold him down. Hold him and that's yep. a much more difficult thing to do than just yep. focus on passing. So what we're gonna look at is the idea of heisting, not up to our feet, but rather to a knee. We have an opponent on two knees in front of us, and as we engage in guard play from here, what we start to find is we, we get people pushing into us because they're afraid of the leg lock game. We'll come upstairs to the head and catch on. 
so the collar looks like so. Now instead of staying in a traditional seated position, from here we're gonna heist and bring our training partner's hands down to the floor. Now from here, we're in a situation where the real skill we're looking for is go-behinds and guillotines. And we play those two off against each other in this position. Once we're in a situation like so, we're looking to get past our opponent's arms. The threat is our opponent will reach out with arms and catch us as we try to go behind them. What we're looking for in situations like this is to go behind the training partner and cover their hips. The rules of Jiu-Jitsu clearly state that if I can hold one of my training partner's knees on the floor in this position, I get the same points as I would for a clean sweep from guard. The problem is people can stand up from here. So we're always looking to break someone down to a hip, just like so, and maintain a position where it's very difficult for them to get up, get a knee off the floor within a three second time frame. As they go to get up, we position ourselves where our knee goes on top of our training partner's knee. So when he tries to get that knee off the floor, it's an awfully difficult thing. Okay, the three seconds are satisfied, and you score a relatively easy sweep. I mean, that was a great to tell you, huh? Yeah, it's yeah. a very simple way to score. I'm gonna say something here, Bernardo. I would say that method of scoring, heisting from bottom and hitting a go behind, is several orders of magnitude easier for most people to learn and use in competition yeah, than traditional sweep. sweeps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, traditional sweeps are hard work without that a game. But this is relatively simple. Yeah, and on top of that, the guy on top is not expecting that. He's expecting like a butterfly exactly. sweep. Uh, yeah. They, they come into it thinking it's going to be the same yeah. old gentleman's agreement where the yeah. bottom guy stays down. Suddenly they got this guy leaping around like a frog from yeah. bottom. It's like, oh my God, yeah. I have to hold this guy down as well as pass his guard. It's, yeah. it's a nightmare. Um, and that brings us to our fifth and final skill that we want to uh, focus on in this video. This is the idea of upper body submissions. Now, um, upper body submissions, it's a problem in no gi. If someone is standing, it's very difficult for me to go into upper body submissions without the collar and the sleeve cuffs. So typically what we do is when people are on two knees, this is when we go upper body. When people stand over us, it's much easier to attack the legs, no gi. Because yep. it doesn't require the use of cuffs or collar. But when someone's down, what we're looking for here is to focus on three submissions, which we really think can work well in this position. The first is the triangle, the second is Judikitami, the armbar, and the third is the guillotine. Now we could show 10,000 upper body submissions from this position. I want my students focusing on the ones that really work well in competition at a high level. Okay? So from situations like so, we start off kicking up with two various forms of triangle attack. We put a very heavy emphasis on the clamp position. The clamp is a situation where I place my two knees clamped around my training partner's head and arm, foot going over the top so I control his posture. The clamp, in a sense, is an upper body ashigurami. The leg configuration is almost identical to a traditional ashigurami, but instead of the hips being controlled, it's the head and one arm. Most defenses from arm bars, triangles, involve the hands being close together. Whenever the hands are close together, it's very hard to go into arm bars and triangles. The clamp does a fine job of separating my opponent's hands. If he tries to bring his hands together, it's physically mm -hmm. impossible. And as a result, it becomes very easy to go into the various forms of attack that we look at. We also look at the idea of going into guillotines from here. We come up and we favor the high wrist position. It creates very, very strong strangulations from this position and gives us an excellent submission rate. So there you have these five key skills, Bernardo, which I push upon my students. I'm a big believer in the idea of as it was simplifying a training program so that students focus right. on only right. the most high percentage submissions and strategies. We looked at this idea of um, when, when we've established a reputation as a strong leg locker and our opponent is reacting to that, when they're moving back and away, we use wrestling reversals. We yep. scrimmage up from the bottom position and look to wrestle them down. When we feel they're putting more pressure on us, we typically go for classic jiu-jitsu sweeps, usually involving X-guard, ashigurami, um, double kuruchi, things like this, knocking them down to a hip or hand, which gives us an unfair advantage as we come up scrummaging nope. from bottom position. If they drop to their knees, then we're gonna go into the simigeshi series. And from there, we have a whole bunch of ways to use simigeshi to get overreactions and throw people and sweep them from bottom. We looked at this idea that 
once people start reacting to the threat of sumigeshi by lowering their heads and making it difficult to get sumigeshi, that's when we start heisting our opponents, coming up from bottom, snapping them down, going behind and scoring one of the easiest forms of reversal in the sport. Our contention is that Jiu-Jitsu for too long has ignored the option of coming up from bottom and has only really emphasized classic submissions and sweeps from bottom. This needs to change. And then finally, we look at the idea of high percentage submissions on the upper body. Um, once we establish uh, a strong upper body threat from guard, primarily through triangle, armbar, and guillotine, as opponents react to that upper body threat, they're going to leave their legs available, they posture away, and then the whole cycle begins again, going back into the leg locks, which started this cycle in Michigan. Right. Yeah, John, I love the fact that, for example, many times when I, when I watch Nogi tournaments, especially in the past, not, not so much nowadays, because you were changing that, but many times you used to see like, the guys who only do leg locks and the other guys who doesn't do leg lock can play like butterfly yes. Nogi, that kind of stuff. So... I feel like now you're unifying both, right? Yes, yes. And we can, if you want to summarize here, we can always assume that the guard one was very focused on leg attacks, and now the guard two is focused is, on reactions to that threat. Yeah, that you learn yeah. in the guard one, yes, that's the right. volume one. Yes. No, that's awesome. So they work together in unison. Um, basically, our our game, it's no surprise, I'm sure, when I describe it to you, is to create a strong initial threat on the legs. Yep, that yep. creates very strong defensive reactions from an opponent. And then there's five ways we can feed off these reactions that people can learn in a relatively short time frame and get a lot of mileage out of. No, and, the, and I can really see that happening because I have seen even, like, uh, I have seen opponents from Warden, for example, saying that they were so much worried about the leg attacks that they, that they end up tapping else. about the back yeah. attacks or yeah. something. So yeah. the, I think uh, the fact that you guys focus so much on leg attacks, but you have this arsenal yes. surrounding the leg attacks yeah. makes it so powerful. You know? but the, the single biggest thing you want to avoid in any combat sport is predictability. Once yep. you become predictable, yep. Yep. you yep. create it over. Yep. So the idea is you want to create these dilemmas for opponent where if they if they don't take your leg attack seriously, they get finished on the legs every time. Okay. But then when they do take the leg attack seriously, Open up then there's five more hole. horns of the yeah, yeah. Like, oh my God, what do yeah. I do to get away from these guys? And um, uh, the interesting thing is that the overall pattern of the game is, is pretty damn simple. I mean, we just described basically our whole open guard philosophy in a very short time frame. And um, uh, of course, learning the techniques um, and getting a feel for them against competitive opponents, that takes time. But the overall blueprint is relatively simple. Um, I've always believed that the best ideas in life are usually relatively simple ideas. I agree. The details that flesh, flesh them out, that's where things get complicated. But the overall assessment of what you're trying to achieve should be relatively simple. Just like classic jiu-jitsu, we always talk about yep. jiu-jitsu as a four to six, uh, six to, uh, step system, it's, it's pretty simple conceptually. Yep. The game itself is complicated, there's many things to learn, yep. but the overall assessment uh, of the system is pretty simple. Yeah, and uh, John, just to finalize, I also love it how you are splitting the uh, new wave jiu-jitsu, because you started with escapes, which I think is the most fundamental yes. thing that any person should learn, right? Then you did position escapes, submission escapes, then guard one attacking the legs, guard two, that's this yes. one that you just I've always demonstrated. had a philosophy of building people up from bottom to top, okay? Yep. So um, your first skill that you should learn is how to get out of bad positions, usually when you're flat on your back or someone's on your back. So you start in the worst case scenarios. Yep. Then you build up from there into guard attacks. I always teach bottom position first. Um, even for heavyweights, even for people whose body is not particularly well suited to bottom position, they start with bottom position because it's intrinsically harder to learn the skills of bottom position than it is top position. So yep. start with the tough stuff first. And then as they develop a good guard game, then they start to learn the top game. Yep. And then once they become competent in bottom, top, then we take them to standing position and the cycle continues yep. and they grow. Um, so yes, you're quite correct. We start with bottom pins escapes and then yeah. I know and I love the fact that it was uh, position of escapes yes then submission escapes and then the guard bottom one 
own attacking the legs. They have guard volume two, so I, I love that it's breaking down as a system. Yes. You know? yeah. It's not like you're throwing a bunch of techniques yeah. and try to learn. <laughs> I, it. I think people have a hard time learning in a random fashion. Yeah. You, you, there has to be some kind of system. Uh, just as when you go through uh, junior high school up to high school yeah. itself, yeah. everything yeah. is taught yeah. step by step, and so too in Jiu Jitsu. No, I, f I fully agree, John. Yeah, so guys, uh, the guard volume 2 of New Wave Jiu Jitsu is going to be at bjjfanatics.com. Maybe by the time you're watching, it's already there. So make sure to check that out. And thanks so much, John. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Please help me out to grow my YouTube channel. Just click subscribe. And to watch more videos, just click under see more videos. I hope you enjoyed. BJJFanatics.com. Use the promo code YouTubeFaria to get 10% off any instructional video. Improve your jujitsu faster.